Hey everyone, welcome to COG. So glad to have you all with us. Uh, I am uh, Caleb Eno, and uh, joining me today is George Zeitz. Hello, Caleb. Ah, okay, this is really, really exciting. Um, I've been kind of working uh, with George on this for a little while. Um, and so today we're, we're doing a special look at a game that George was actually a lead designer on for a while uh, at NXL, and that game is Wasteland 3. So I am, I'm really excited. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, George is a longtime professional developer. Uh, it'd be a great opportunity for y'all to ask questions of him and, uh, yeah, so in interact with him as well. And he's, he's regularly a part of our COG community, so I'm sure uh, he's available around for, for questions, interactions, other points as well. But uh, thanks for joining me here, George. I'm really looking forward to this. This is going to be a lot of fun. Oh, very happy to be here, Caleb. And I'm very happy to talk about a game that, I worked on for quite a number of years, uh, was not there for the, the tail end of production, and have not actually really played yet. So we will be, you will be seeing live my reactions to the final game. All right. Well, why don't we start, George, with talking a little bit just about yourself and your history? Sure. So uh, I am now the CEO uh, and co-founder of Digimancy Entertainment, which is a remote uh, remote focused studio that's technically based here in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Although uh, the only the only two uh, members of the team who are actually in Columbus, Ohio, are uh, on this stream, you and me. <laughs> um, so uh, formerly, I have been a designer uh, and a writer at uh, Obsidian Entertainment um, in California, and then later in Exile Entertainment. Um, some of my games were Neverwinter Nights Two, uh, the sequel, Master of the Betrayer. Um, Fallout New Vegas, Pillars of Eternity, um, and also Torment, Ties of Numenera, uh, obviously in addition to Wasteland 3. Um, I've been making games for about 20 years, uh, or almost 20 years, um, and then of course I was the lead designer on this game uh, up until 2019 when I left the company to found Digimancy. Uh, and then they had about nine months or so of um, mostly Microsoft-funded um, polish and improvement to this game uh, before or after I left and, and until they shipped. Uh, so I, I, they have the game um, <clears throat> as we're going to be seeing it, at least in terms of content, is largely as it was when I left, as far as I know. Uh, but they did a lot of really nice polish that we'll be seeing as we get started. Like even this this Scorpitron. I don't know if you've got this up yet, Caleb. Not but, up yet. Uh, we'll see. We'll get yet. to it. So the, the, the introductory screen, like a lot of really beautiful art and, and polish that we did not have the budget for until Microsoft bought the company um, in, in late 2019, uh, right around the time I left. And you can talk a little bit more about uh, your role kind of as a lead designer with an exile. Um, so I was, uh, so I had been on Torment. Um, Torment Tides of Numenera, which is the game that was before Wasteland 3. Um, and I had been lead area designer on that. Um, I'd been lead narrative designer on a bunch of games before that. Uh, Wasteland 3 was actually my first, uh, my first gig as a lead designer on a project. Um, so it was, uh, it was, you know, an interesting challenge to sort of be in charge of the whole design team. Um, I was mostly focused on content. Um, it's very typical for uh, a lead designer to kind of have like their area of the thing that the areas that they're very good at, and then you want to have strong designers in other areas um, to to take care of the areas that are not your specialties. Um, so I was very focused on the content and the writing and the narrative and the story and uh, the quests, area you know, level design, area design, like all of that stuff. I was very focused on, and then we had some systems designers who were um, focused on that side of things, and I would be overseeing parts of that. But we also had um, uh, one of our project directors, um, Chris Keenan, was also very interested in the system side. So it was very much a team effort on, on that side of things. Awesome. So Wasteland 3 is, I presume, the third entry in a consecutive <laughs> series. It is indeed. Um, although there was a very big time gap between the first of the series and the second of the series. So um, waste, the original Wasteland game actually predates Fallout. 
Uh, a lot of people today don't don't realize that, but um, Wasteland, the original, came out in 1988, uh, and that was uh, the very first post-apocalyptic RPG that, at least that I am aware of. It's possible there is some other one that I've never heard of, but uh, as far as I know, that was the very first. Um, and it incorporated some things that we see in RPGs regularly today that had really never been done before. Like they did things with choices and consequences that really hadn't been done up until that point. Um, they had some pretty dark stuff in that game um, that uh, come up in Wasteland too. Like they did some nods to it that um, you, you really hadn't seen in games before that. Um, and uh, I don't actually know how well it did. I think it did reasonably well, but um, when eventually, so that was done by Interplay, uh, Brian Fargo's company back in, back in the 80s and 90s. Um, then uh, Interplay eventually did Fallout, which borrowed a lot of things from Wasteland, but was a very different franchise. And Wasteland kind of went by the wayside for a very long time uh, until I believe 2012, um, when Brian Fargo, who had Interplay had died in the interim, and then he um, he started uh, in Exile Entertainment uh, in the early 2000s. Um, and then he um, got the rights for the Wasteland franchise, which had just sort of been sitting. I don't remember what company it was that had the had it, but it was like some some weird thing where like the rights to that had gone with a bunch of other rights after Interplay died to some other company. Maybe it was like a Japanese company or something. But at any rate, he got it back. Uh, had always wanted to make it, but there weren't any publishers who were willing to do it uh, until um, the Kickstarter era. And Wasteland 2 was one of the first big game, one of the first big successes of the Kickstarter period of like around 2011, 2012. Um, along with the, so the Double Fine Adventure was one of the big ones. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, Wasteland 2, uh, which they wanted, I think, 900,000. Uh, and they ended up getting $3 million. <laughs> Which is still not that much money to make an RPG. Um, right. So the budget, like, Brian had to put in some of his own personal money. He got some investments from other places. But, like, that was the beginning of that Kickstarter era where a whole bunch of um, RPGs of the, the previous, I don't know, 10, 20 years were getting kickstarted. And there was this renaissance of, you know, games like Pillars of Eternity, games like Torment. Um, that eventually that, that came out. Um, and Wasteland 2, I would say, was probably one of the more successful ones. Uh, mm. it, uh, it, was, uh, it did pretty well. Um, it had good ratings. Uh, and then on the back of that, we, uh, we did, actually, we did our Kickstarter, not Kickstarter, we did our crowdfunding for this game, Wasteland 3, on a different platform, Fig. Um, and I think made a, a similar, I actually don't even remember what, what our, total was for that but i think it was a similar amount of money um <clears throat> even though the sort of kickstarter fig uh era had started to decline a little bit by that point um so there was still like a, a clearly a um an appetite for wasteland games uh and our goal was to like wasteland 2 had sort of been the first of those kickstarter games like or one of the first of those kickstarter games like we had we were bringing back an old franchise uh but there were still a lot of there were still a lot of things that we felt we could have done better uh, and Wasteland 3, we really wanted to go um, and, and fix all the stuff that we hadn't done to our satisfaction the first time around. Um, and I and in the end, even though initially we didn't quite have the budget to do that, once Microsoft came in, we really were able to do it. And I think we, I think the end result uh, is kind of what Brian wanted for a Wasteland game all along, and ultimately got in Wasteland 3. Mm. Now, Wasteland 3 came out this this year in August, the end of August. When did it start production? Um, so I remember making the goofy uh, video for the Wasteland 3 um, Kickstarter campaign, I believe in 2016, when we were still working on um, Torment. Uh, they, I, I still remember, like, they had me, you could probably find it somewhere online, like, <laughs> it was fine going to each of the people, like, some of the principal narrative people and, and, like, quote, recruiting us for the, for the game, and, like, each of us was in some wacky situation, I was, like, a cowboy or something, <laughs> so, um, uh, that was, <laughs> that was 2016, um, the very early, um, sort of narrative high level design stuff was happening even while torment was finishing up so i was taking some time to do 
like I, I, I think uh, Gavin Jurgens Fury and I came up with the patriarch and sort of the core story um, in late 2016. Um, we didn't really get into true work on the game. Like that was mostly on paper stuff. We didn't really start making stuff until 2017. Um, Which is, oh yeah, it's, go ahead. it's fairly it's fairly common, especially in RPGs, where like a lot of times um, you will you will like you'll have a as you're finishing up the game that the studio is currently on. Mm. Um, a lot of times you'll take a few people off of that project, like part time, to start figuring out what your next project is going to be. Right, um, and you can't really you can't take those people off 100 percent because there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, but you kind of want to get rolling on what's this game about? Like, you know, your high level pillars and narrative and all that kind of stuff. Um, even before the previous game is finished. Yeah. I mean, especially thinking about like how, how long the development cycle is, because that's what approximately three years or so of a development cycle. So, and what's yep. the team size that was working on this? That is a good question. I, I don't really remember what, um, it varied a lot. Um, I, I want to say probably 30 or 40, okay. um, but, but it, you know, it, it can be all over the map. Like in the early days, it can be fairly small. Um, a lot of times toward the end of these projects, like these, especially these big RPGs, um, you'll get into situations where it's like all hands on deck and they'll pull in people from other projects to try to finish things up. So you'll get like a whole bunch of people coming in like artists and mm -hmm. um, level designers and stuff to try to get a project finished. So, you can have uh, an almost sometimes like 50% increase in team size toward the end of some of these things. Um, and I, I honestly didn't, like I wasn't really watching our numbers that carefully. So I'm not even sure what the, what the like peak team size was on this game. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're looking at like rolling development cycles like that, then you just always have to kind of keep the ball rolling because you want to be able to continue. You you don't want the gap between your releases to be too big because that's that's a financial risk right there. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. interesting. Yep. Lot as you've recently discovered with founding your own company, there's all of this stuff that goes on behind the scenes just to yeah, keep it all working. Yeah. Yep. And when when you're in the trenches, you don't really you're not aware of a lot of this stuff and, and sort of what the what the executives are having to juggle to make sure that you get your next paycheck um but there's always a lot a lot going on you know you're sort of focused on your own thing like i gotta make this great level um but you don't you know and you want <laughs> you want that extra time and um you know you want to be able to do your absolute best work but sometimes when they say sorry you know we got to cut this off we got to move on or we got to bring in more people to help you finish it quickly and it's because that's you needed to get your paychecks yeah 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 so um we're looking here at, at wasteland 3 um a couple of things uh oh so it was developed in unity was that um was in exile previously doing games in unity or was this yeah yeah so unity um we actually so i shouldn't say we uh on wasteland 2 i was not on that team uh they used unity for for wasteland 2 I believe they started in Unreal. Um, okay. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I'm like 90% sure about that. Um, and I think then they ended up, yeah, and actually this, a lot of this is coming back to me. Um, they ended up switching to Unity largely because of the asset store. Um, because, uh, so the, the budget, like I mentioned, was really not super high on Wasteland 2, um, even though it seems like a lot, $3 million. Um, so Brian was looking for any way to keep costs down that he possibly could. And initially they were thinking of, of using, I think they even started the game in Unreal, but then he discovered the asset store and how much savings he could get from buying assets off of the asset store. Um, and Unity had that infrastructure much more uh, than, than Unreal did, at least at that time. Mm. So uh, he switched over to, to Unity on Wasteland 2. We used Unity on Torment. Um, and actually that played off of, uh, Obsidian, Pillars of Eternity, uh, used Unity as well. And we borrowed a bunch of their tech for Torment to get a head start. Uh, and then we rolled right into Wasteland 3, continuing to use Unity. So that was three projects in a row, um, that, uh, in Exile had used Unity on their games. Cool. I know that there's a lot of people who are using Unity here for their their personal development. So I think it's it's pretty cool to be able to see like a high level 
you know published game launched in Unity, you can kind of get a at least a, a glimpse into what you can do in, in in the platform. So that's really neat. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, Unity is is being used more and more. There's there's obviously a lot. There's a lot of what I would call like double A studios around now um, that are using Unity. Um, it is cheaper to use. Uh, a lot of people have become quite expert in it. There's a lot you can do in it, clearly. Um, and even at Digimancy, uh, my company, uh, we are using Unity for the project that uh, that we're working on right now that unfortunately I can't talk about, but uh, <laughs> it, is, it is also a, a publisher-backed project. Uh, I have a question in the chat. Um, uh, Wes is recalling that Unity had Linux support. He's asking if any uh, if any devs that you know of have been using Unity with Linux. I know I've personally used it only on Windows. Um, devs, not that I am aware of. Um, so on Torment, maybe Wasteland too, but on Torment, I know we supported Linux, um, and that was partly because uh, there were there was a vocal <laughs> Linux community that supported our game and wow. really wanted the game to be that that you know to, to have Linux support. So we made sure we we did that. Um, I to be honest, I don't know what the the status of that was for Wasteland Three, and I am not aware of any devs that like use Linux in their work, but hmm. there could be. I don't yeah, know. that's interesting. I, I know in uh, in the world that I kind of previously came from, of software development using um, like web dev and that kind of thing, Linux is very common. Um, mm. All right. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about Wasteland Three here. Uh, I, I do. We, we do want to want to get jumping into the game here soon. Um, sure. One thing I want to point out for our viewers is that um, Wasteland Three does have an M. Uh, rating and that's a uh, 17 plus mature you can see the list here of the things that they cite for the reason that it is an m rating um, i have personally played the game a little bit and i can absolutely verify that if you are squeamish about blood and guts there is a considerable amount of this in the level that we're going to play <laughs> um uh, uh, and there's also there's quite a bit of strong uh, cursing language as well. So I just kind of want you to be aware of that, viewers, that that is a thing uh, to be aware of in this game, which is a little bit outside of what we would normally show. We want, you know, our, our community standards are more like we try to, you know, no cursing, try to stay away from that, try to... What's, what's a phrase that Wes always uses? If you wouldn't say it to your grandmother, don't say it here, I think. Um, so we're, we're breaking that a little bit here for this, but I, I think there's a lot of really interesting things from a design perspective that we can drill down into here, um, as well as a narrative perspective. There's some really fascinating narrative stuff going on in this game. And I know, George, uh, you were talking to me earlier just before we started that you wish we could get into later on in the game where there's a lot yeah. more rich narrative experience. And I know that's that's kind of your background is like rich, deep narrative experiences. Yeah, yep. no, that's true. And I, I, will, I, <laughs> I, will, I will take some responsibility for the blood and guts in this. Um, that we, <laughs> We knew we, were, we we knew we wanted that stuff. So I like early on, Brian, uh, Brian and I talked a lot about that. So I really gave it to him. Um, but uh, <laughs> the the language is is I, I tend not to write with a lot of strong language, and that but that is something that was sort of part of the Wasteland franchise. Um, so it's it's continues to be in here. And and yes, please please try to look past that if you're someone who doesn't enjoy a lot of f bombs. All right. Uh, so can you give us a, a, just before we jump into the game here, can you give us a quick primer on the Wasteland overarching narrative? Sure. So uh, in the Wasteland world, uh, and remember that this game was, uh, this universe was conceived in the late, the mid to late 80s, uh, when, you know, very much Cold War was on, um, you know, the bombs could fall at any moment, kind of a feeling. Um so uh, it is set, uh, or the, the background of the Wasteland universe in 1998, um, and assuming obviously that none of the things that happened in our world actually happened, so like the Soviet Union did not fall, um, you know, nothing, but there was not sort of that, the 90s of, of this universe was not the 90s of our universe. Um, so uh, in 1998, the uh, United States puts up this, this saddle, this giant, almost like a, 
orbital fortress kind of a thing um it was called citadel star station um that had uh it was it was kind of like what the what Reagan's Star Wars program was supposed to be. So it was like the idea was it would take out any missiles that were coming for right. uh, for the United States. Uh, but for some reason, it uh, it registered a Soviet assault, even though there wasn't one. Uh, and then the missiles, the United States fired missiles against the Soviets. The Soviets fired in the Chinese, and everybody sort of nuked each other. Um, so in Wasteland One is. I want to say like maybe 60 or 70 years after the original event. So it's like sometime in the mid to late 20s, 21st century. Um, and the desert Rangers are a group uh, that descended from a bunch of army Rangers who were out in the Arizona desert when the bombs fell. Uh, and they ended up taking shelter inside this prison and becoming this like um, protectors of the wasteland um, and trying to bring civilization back to the wasteland. So uh, Wasteland One was them. Um, ultimately, uh, the, the the enemy, the final enemy in that game was this uh, Lakotis AI, which was like this evil artificial intelligence that it turned out uh, had been responsible for the Citadel Star Station mistake. It was sort of like War Games, where it was like, "Ha ha ha!" I'm gonna wait. Yeah. Um, so the, that was the Cochise AI. They supposedly destroyed it at the end of Wasteland. Uh, but then Wasteland 2, we discover, no, the Cochise AI was still alive. Um, and the evil robots are back and they want to destroy humanity again. Uh, and then, of course, the Rangers, you are again playing as the, the Desert Rangers, and they foiled them again. Uh, they foiled the Cochise AI again. And uh, this time, in order to, to fully destroy it, they had to nuke their own headquarters. So a lot of the Rangers got killed and there wasn't much left. And they're in a very bad state at the end of Wasteland 2. Uh, and the intro movie for Wasteland 3, I think, will catch us up with where we are now. Um, so I'll let that play. And if you have any questions afterward, you can you can ask me for more lore background. Sounds good. All right. Well, let's flip over to the game show here. So we should be able to see it now. Um, this may require a slight bit of fiddling with audio i tried to i tried to get it configured earlier also this is going to be kind of weird but i need to move our portraits around a little bit as the, a lot of there's a lot of critical information at the the bottom corner here but actually for the intro movie i'm just going to move this back okay uh let's go ahead and watch the opening cinematic start a new game and hopefully audio works fingers crossed Oh, right. A lot of difficulty. I, I would do Wastelander. Yeah. Sounds I good. Think that's a, that works. Yes, I think that's what I was playing on earlier. I get a thumbs up in the chat if the audio is good. It's been a rough few years for the Desert Rangers. When the world ended, they tried to bring some order to what was left of Arizona. But then the Cochise AI woke up, and they found themselves in a fight to the death with its robot army. In the end, they had to nuke their own base to kill the damn thing for good. Been hard going ever since. Then, the Rangers heard from a fella calling himself the Patriarch. Said he owned Colorado, but his kids were trying to steal it from him. And if the Rangers were to come and put him in their place, he'd give Arizona all the food and supplies it needed to rebuild and survive. Whoa, whoa! Sorry, Major. No way we're getting through. Four, Cody. Advanced team reported an alternate route across a frozen lake. Find it. Copy that. Well, reluctant as the Rangers are to interfere in family squabbles, they weren't really in a position to say no. A route's around that dam on the far shore. Scouts, check out the ice and lead us across. Yes, ma'am. 
So the brass sent Ranger Team November across the Rockies. Because the aid he was promising the Rangers wasn't just their best hope. It was their last. Okay, Major. All good. Come ahead. But that's the thing about the Rangers. It doesn't matter how hard it gets or how many of them fall. They keep on fighting. The Rangers never stop fighting. So there you go. Very nice. I, I actually, I remember writing the first version of that, <laughs> that, that little intro movie. They, it, it went through a lot of iteration, but it's cool to see how it finally came together. All right. Uh, so one, one thing to, to keep in mind, or one thing I should, I should describe here real quick, Caleb. So yes. um, in, in all previous Wasteland games, um, you would just sit down after the intro and create four characters. Um, and it was a very long process, mm, it took a yeah. long time to get into the game. Um, and also, <laughs> um, you really didn't know, like if you hadn't played Wasteland before, you didn't really know what your skills did. So you were like, sure, automatic weapons, why not? Oh yeah, <laughs> weapon modding, okay. And like, you really didn't know what was useful, you didn't know what would fit your, your play style. So one of the things that they wanted to do, or that we wanted to do in this game was, um, start you out and only have to make, uh, well, originally you were only going to make one new character, uh, but eventually it became a pair of new characters. Mm. Um, that was more to accommodate uh, multiplayer. Uh, so you can do that. Like you, if you'll notice at the bottom, it says create custom oh, characters. custom characters, I see. So you can do that. Uh, I, we shouldn't do that for this. I agree, uh, right I now agree. To get in. But so we created these pairs and they kind of have little narrative background for each of them. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, there you go. So you could see like each of them kind of has their own little, uh, background and reason that they're fighting together. I am going to suggest going for someone who has animal handling mm -hmm. for reasons that will become apparent. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I, I will admit that, uh, I, I love animal handling. I'm a, I'm always a pet class person if I can do it. Uh, or animal whisper, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think this this pair is actually pretty good. Uh, yeah, I would probably go for that. I think to in fact, they might... see, I always uh, when when I when I was looking through these, and I by the way, I really love this because mm. I feel like rather than just creating some empty shell shell character that I'm taking over, this made it feel for me like I had characters that I immediately had some sort of investment in, some kind of, I cared mm -hmm. about who these people were. Um, and the fact mm -hmm. that there were this sort of like pre-generated, like not, not deeply created characters, but like there was something there I could already sort of hook onto as a player. And so I found myself sort of struggling between which group of characters did I think would be the most interesting to play and also, did their skills kind of look like they were something I was going to be interested in playing with? It's mm. it funny that both of those things um, fell into it. This is the group that I ended up going with on my last playthrough for the reason the, uh, is that I, I like the, the like computer hacking and nerd stuff. Like back in Deus Ex, that's yeah. what I liked doing, was picking the, the computer hacking skills and solving problems. So I went with this one. But yeah, we can go with uh, this group here. One, one interesting point uh, before you selected, Caleb, so like one thing that we had also wanted to do with these was 
Um, we wanted to give these characters also like little storylines in the game mm. um, where like you'd, you'd not just have like, you know, you wouldn't just be picking these characters and then sort of imagining in your heads their interactions, but like actually having some chatter between them and maybe having like a special quest for each of the pairs. We did not, I don't think they got that in the game. We certainly didn't by the time I was done. So that's the one thing that I wish we had gotten to do, but right. we didn't. An example of like, as you know, making games, like there's always all that stuff. You're like, oh, it'd be so cool to get this in. And in this case, this was something we were like, we really want to get this in. But we, we just, I, you know, the time, we ran out of time. Uh, I don't think there's any reactivity, but that had been desired and planned. There was a, a question on the pro how, the process behind creating the pairs of the characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that actually, so it, it, this idea came up pretty late in production. Uh, originally, it was just going to be you're creating, you know, or I think maybe you had, maybe it, there were some pre-made characters, but they didn't have any like narrative behind them. And they weren't organized in pairs like this. Um, so it was something that was like, hey, we're going to do this thing. I don't even remember whose idea it was. It wasn't mine. Um, and so uh, we, we just went to one of the writers uh, and we were like, hey, Nathan, that's, he's, he's been doing Wasteland for a long time. Come up with like 12 pairs of characters. <laughs> he's like okay and he's he's good at, at coming up with like neat interesting characters so he came up with like 12 pairs and then we narrowed it down to the six that you see here i think actually the last pair was not in the original set uh and it i believe the one you like and i believe it was because uh me, i think i and maybe other people had said hey like where's the nerds like where's like the <laughs> really nice people because like i i like you caleb i i kind of like playing those people like i like playing wizards in in D, &D games and stuff right. so um that they came in i think later as like the, the the cool nerds but uh everybody else was from that original batch that, that nathan wrote up all right um so i go ahead and go with this uh this group yeah let's do it all right selecting pair Hold him off, Team November. Drive train on this heap is shot. But buy me a minute, and I think I can get the weapons online. So... Oops. Sorry. Take well, that's okay. I don't know. Oh, there. That was my The enemy's mouse. going there. The enemy's going there. Yeah, you can see the, the rangers are getting wiped out. Yes. Don't miss. Don't miss. Don't fill my blades for that. Uh, so this is another thing, um, this intro sequence, well, this is the whole level we're going to be playing through, uh, went through many, many, many iterations. Um, it is very common, especially in RPGs, probably in all games, but I mostly make RPGs. Um, so this has been something that I've seen a lot. The first level of the game, like the intro level, goes through so many changes. Um, this thing was probably redone from scratch at least three times, and then even just this sequence right here, I mean, it must have been like a half dozen iterations. There was there was a version where we had like there was a fight here, and then like a vehicle came like flying in and landed, and it was like blowing stuff up. It, 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 this this actually even changed since I left, although this basic setup was always the same. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I always tell people. Don't if you're when you're designing like a uh, your vertical slice or like a sample level of the game. Don't even bother starting with the first level of the game because it's going to change <laughs> so much. Like you almost want to design your first level of your game like toward the end, right. um, because you know then like what you actually have to demonstrate uh, and what you have to teach the player. And that was totally what happened here. Like we changed this every time we realized we'd have to teach the player some other mechanic or some central thing would change, we would have to redesign the beginning again. Mm. Um, and, and so as we go through this, I'll try to point this stuff out, but you'll notice like key things that will be important later in the game are being taught, even in this, just this first fight. Yeah, absolutely. Let, let's let's dive into some of that here. So I, I think one of the things that um, that struck me right away as, as being a really clever choice was that, um, especially if you are a player who has never played like XCOM, which this is, is a very similar combat style system to that mm -hmm. sort of like tactical grid strategy game, um, was that you you did not get to go first. 
So you actually mm-hmm. had to watch the enemies go and then some other allies go before you even had the option of getting to act at all on your own. And so even even if you know you you still have a lot you need to figure out and kind of like understand, you actually got to watch play out around you what it is that your goal was going to be like okay there's bad guys mm-hmm. they're shooting at me and then there's good guys and they're shooting at the bad guys and so you can kind of like without any other introduction pick up on this is the goal of what the scenario is yeah absolutely and another element of that that is interesting and that's really important because it's very different from wasteland 2 um was if you'll notice um the two sides all go at the same time so like the enemy all goes, and then the player, the uh, the player side all goes. Mm, so yeah. In Wasteland Two, there was like up at the top of the screen, it was very busy. You'd see like all these little portraits of like all the different characters in the fight, um, and it would be like an enemy would go, and then right. one of your guys, and then two yeah, enemies. That initiative then, system. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So now in this game, uh, it's it's all one side, and then all the other side. And it, it just goes back and forth. And one thing that's nice about that is you can coordinate your guys a little bit better. Um, so, like you right now, you, as you can see, you've got William. Uh, William is selected, and then Lee Singh is next to him. If you want to to have Lee Singh go first, and like you know set up William for something, you can totally do that. Like you can just click on Lee Singh, and then she can. Uh, she's a she's a missile combat person, and then he's a melee combat person. Um, so you can have them go in any order you want and then like later when you have bigger squads of like six and seven people you can coordinate your team much more effectively oh i took too long the tutorial's like maybe i need to give you more information which hey that's actually a good thing like that that mm-hmm. the, the tutorial is, is continuing to kind of like nudge you so the first box that came up and actually like just talking briefly about the design of these boxes is interesting so um there's there's certain games that I've played where they give you just huge tutorial box drops where it's like this whole big thing. Actually, Kingdom Hearts is one of these offenders where they sort of completely take you out of everything. They give you this big box that sometimes has multiple pages explaining different things that they're trying to help you understand. Um, okay. And I really like this because this is a simple idea. It's in the header. It's got a static image of what you're doing. And I, the, this game is actually really good about swapping back and forth icons so it knows that I'm using a keyboard right now. So it's got the keyboard icons it does have controller compatibility which i haven't tried out i don't know how that feels but it does also give you all of the the buttons for controllers which is really nice as well Um, but then it just gives you a basic explanation of what's going on a continue button and then this just get rid of all tutorials (laughs) we'll we'll, we'll leave them up for now but yeah no i think they're they're good um so one thing that you'll notice immediately um you have the the blue so there's like a little blue outline around a few boxes there that is the range that uh leasing can move in and still be able to shoot now i don't you probably shouldn't move her because she's she's behind cover right now cover is critical in this game like yeah you never want to be out uh out of cover you can get hit really easily um if you move her outside of that blue range she won't be able to fire this turn um which obviously is is not so good um so what i uh would what i would typically do in this situation is look around at the enemies and see see like uh which ones have a really high hit percentage like you can see there's somebody in the back there with a 95 i want to say yep Uh, yeah so so i'll I'll point out kind of how how this is is doing this so if you're focused on where the player is currently what you see is your hit chance percentages on everybody on the field from where they are if you move them then it's giving you the hit chance percentages for um what they would be if you were to move there but it also gives you line of sight in both directions so you can see who is in line of sight of you and who is not and that's a new thing too. The line of sight thing, in particular, uh, that is new since I left the project. So that's a that was a nice addition. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the yeah or orange area, blue area the dichotomy is something. Uh, if if you've played XCOM, it's going to be very very familiar with it. Actually, even the icons for for cover, it's uh, it's it's just it's so 
communicative and simple that you have the uh, the dichotomy between full cover and, and partial cover. So you got the half the half shield and the full shield, and it's, I think it's the same exact thing as XCOM. And it's like, don't change. You don't always have to reinvent the wheel on every single thing that you make in your game. Like people have have trialed things out, they figured out what works a lot of times, and so. It's not always necessarily bad to replicate things that are done very well. Um, lets you then make interesting choices in other areas of game of your game rather than having to reinvent every aspect of it. Yep, I also absolutely. really like the the pathing that shows you what the the walk path is. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really great. Yeah, they did a nice job on that. That's another thing. Um they changed i believe or they improved like it's it's interesting how they have like it's kind of it starts out thin and then it gets thick as you get to the mm. where they're going to be it's neat yeah what's also really nice about this is i don't think that there's a very big chance of you actually if you if you if you at least let's like shoot at everybody every turn you'll pretty much win this it's not uh it's not really going to Unless you know something I don't know, George. But as far as I know, this is a pretty easily winnable fight. It, it is, although what they did re did a really nice job with, and it gets even worse in a minute, is it doesn't feel like it's going to be. Like, ah, as, you're going, yeah. as you're going through this fight, like, those characters that, like, not your guys, but those the other characters that are the rangers, they're going to get annihilated. And <laughs> it, look, it looks like you are in huge trouble here, um, but ultimately you're not. I don't... I almost don't think it's possible to lose this. I don't know, um, but it sure doesn't feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like, I'll, I'll let you start playing and. and uh, yeah. Now, if you take a quick look, you'll kind of get a sense of, of, of what's going on here. So if you see, there's this private who has 18 out of 46 maximum health, and then you've got 25, 18. But if you look at the enemies, 19 health, 21 health, 21 health. Like they're they've got really low health markers, and your two primary characters is 63 and 81. So like you're already out of the gate, way more powerful than any of the other characters on the board. Um, and yeah. uh, oh, go ahead. You, you'll notice too, um, they will the enemies will intentionally not shoot at you until all of the other rangers are dead. Mm. Um, and I believe their chances of hitting you are fairly low. I don't know exactly how they set that up, but like. Well, you'll you'll see as we go, yeah. um, but uh, they they made sure again to make this feel threatening, but not really be all that threatening. Now the 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 bar down here at the bottom shows your action points, so AP. Mm -hmm. That that as you can see, as you move, it shows you how much AP your different actions will use up. Um, so that's very. It's a nice little subtle uh, visual change to help, um, and you can hover over specific actions and you'll see the same thing that like it has a certain AP cost and then it'll take up that much, which actually I really like because it allows you to, you know, I have seven action points. And so if I wanted to, I can attack twice, but that's, that's an option that is available to me. Um, I think so, some games will only let you attack one time per turn. Um, and I, I like that this kind of gives you the freedom to be able to do that. The limiting factor here actually ends up becoming ammo on your weapon. Mm -hmm. is... Yeah, it, it depends on the type of weapon you're using, too. Like the guy, uh, William, with the knife, if he's close enough to an enemy, he can get off um, probably two attacks before the end of his turn. Mm. Uh, Lee, Lee Sing with her sniper rifle, like the sniper rifle has a fairly large um, action point cost. I don't think it's possible to attack twice in the same Oh yeah, time. that's six. Yep. Yeah. But um, but there there actually is something you can do once you shoot with her. Um, you can choose to, like to not use up her final action point or action points. Yeah. And then you can, yeah, I was gonna talk you can, about that. Okay, yeah, I'll let you. I'll let yeah, you get to that. We'll, we'll get to that. But I, I like the options that are available to you. But let's go ahead and move. So we've got our guy here. William is a melee character. And so we've got a melee opportunity here. So go ahead and. Still breathing. Now, what I love there is they intentionally set up those characters so that your PCs can take them out in a single hit. Mm. Um, so you feel powerful, like you have just removed a piece from the board. Yeah. Um, as you get 
further into the game, that's much less common. Um, but in this scenario, it's a really nice feeling. It's like, ah, I just killed one of the door seats. Um, and I can see what I have accomplished, you know, through mm. one of them being gone. Uh, oh, I just noticed a question in the chat. Um, it's a question from Jason. What is your view on the role of randomness in RPGs? Where is it good? Where is it bad? Are negative random events okay? Um, so it depends on what we're talking about. Um, I tend not to love randomness in RPGs. Uh, there's, you will get different um, designers that have very different opinions on this. Um, <clears throat> I personally don't like missing. I don't think it's fun. Um, I would prefer to know exactly like this is the amount of damage that I will do if I do this attack. Um, and you know maybe it'll maybe it'll kill an enemy, maybe it won't. Um, but like I am uh, I am able to strategize at a high level. like I know pretty well what my attacks are going to do and then I can determine um, you know how I want to employ that. Um, missing it, I, I guess you know it, it kind of a lot of the, the missing stuff and the randomness. A lot of it comes out of D and D, uh, <laughs> and I think over time we've been sort of getting further and further away from D and D in a lot of ways. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question. Randomness in events is a diff is very different. Uh, randomness in like uh, interesting little narrative events and stuff like that. I think that actually can be fun and can vary up your experience quite a bit. Uh, I'm not a fan of like random um, encounters that are just kind of like junk combat, but I am a fan of like, um, you know, the team writes a hundred little random events that could happen anywhere, and who knows if I'm going to run into those in a given play session or mm -hmm. in a given uh, uh, in a given run through the game. So I think randomness can be employed in different ways. Some of them work, some of them don't. Mm. Yeah, so now now we only have one AP left here. So you do have the option of ending your turn. You just burn that AP point. You don't do anything with it. But I think there's there's some really interesting choices that you get. Um, so there's if you can do the ambush action, which if you're familiar, it's, it's often called like an Overwatch a reaction shot, that kind of a thing. And that actually takes the amount of AP equal to firing your weapon. So you can basically hold that, and then if the enemy moves into range, you take a shot at them, and so you can potentially uh, prevent enemy movement on your turn. We can't do that one, because that actually would require us if not headshot already. Um, but there's these two other options, which I think are really... Uh, there, there are nice little nuance and flavor to the to using up of action points. So you have defend, and what that will do is that will just use up however many action points you have left. And depending on how many action points you're using up, you can get additional defensive evasion boosts to your character. And so that will, you know, if you're worried that they might be gunned down or they're in a vulnerable position, using a bunch of action points to protect them at the end of your turn could be really valuable and the other one is this prepare action um, so then you can actually carry over action points to your next turn um, for additional mobility or additional actions for your character which i think is really neat too um yeah i love these and these got added late um these actually got added after i left the left the project um I was I, I find prepare to be but I particularly love that because there's nothing more frustrating than like I've got those two extra action points I can't yeah. do anything with them and now they're gone but but here you can actually make use of them which is cool yeah yeah which I think is, is really cool I'm just gonna go ahead and use defend for the time being uh -oh. Uh -oh. it's about to get worse <laughs> that's not good Brian loves his giant robots <laughs> that's part of why these are in there and there's a nice F bomb. And there's the F bomb. Yeah. And you can see your guy is getting annihilated. Yep. <laughs> and I, I, I came up with these characters too, like the names and stuff for them. There's so I, I feel bad when I see poor Private the Boss and everybody else getting annihilated. <laughs> so, so, she, so she's, uh, this is cool. She's working on. So that vehicle there is like the prototype of later in the game, you're going to get a vehicle. Sadly, I don't think in this, this sequence we're playing now you're going to no. get to it. But, um, but you're going to get a vehicle that will have like a, a cool weapon on top of it. So this is our way of uh, previewing for you what you're going to have later. And you actually will get to use it in a moment. I don't want to spoil it too much. But <laughs> she's, she's preparing what's going to happen in the next turn. Which is going to be very useful, considering that there is this uh, very, very, very deadly robot in the middle of everything. 
Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't even try to mess with that. No, no, not definitely not even try. Uh, but I'm gonna see if I can slide around to the side here and do another hackity hack. Oh, it didn't kill him. Nope. Oh wait, you get it. You'll have another attack. I think. Yep. Maybe. Yep. So yeah, thirteen to nineteen damage. Well, I'll take him out. Excellent. And this person who and that, so this this is where you start and you'll get into the strategy thing of like, okay, I've got my sniper here. This guy is vulnerable. This is a very open shot right here. So I can use my sniper, get a ninety five percent chance to take him out, so I can do a little defensive action here. There we nice. go. Did it Prepare looks like his gun. leg his leg got blown off. Uh, <laughs> it oh, it would appear possibly, yes. Ooh. Oh dear. Oh. That's the end of your red shirt. Now, Notice how it's missing you. I know, I was going to ask control. about that. Mm -hmm. So, so what I noticed was, is that the... Okay, I'm going to move that away. What I noticed was, and I didn't notice this on my first playthrough, but because uh, on my first playthrough, I was just like, oh, he missed me, I'm not dead, you know? And I, mm -hmm. felt, I was like, oh boy. But what I noticed this time through is that the trigger, and I, I'm going to ask this as a question, the trigger for this turning on was everybody else dying. Is that correct? Do you know that? I, I, I don't think so. I think it always comes on in the third turn. Okay. Uh, and I think it's just balanced in such a way that almost every time everybody else is dead. Gotcha. Yeah. But yeah, I did notice that there were quite a few misses on my primary mm. character. I do wonder if that was also <laughs> intentional. Suspicious, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so one thing I would suggest is don't do anything with William or Lee Singh right now. Oh, yes. Go of course. to the turret. Yeah. And now... Select the turret and use that to. Yeah, so this this is actually really nice because it introduces you to this concept. There are things that do area effect. It becomes mm -hmm. you think you get grenades later on, which is very helpful. Um, yep. But yeah, this, this is an area effect. Uh, probably not ideal to use it where one of your characters are. Um, nope. <laughs> uh, I will I will say that there's there's good highlighting there, so you get. Um, the the main character is highlighted in this but actually you if you notice there's a subtle difference between the highlighting being done on the enemies versus on the main character so the main character goes to a blue highlight and it's a light to a dark but you lose almost all of the character's texture which makes it really stand out around the background but if you look on the enemies it goes from a red to down to almost their completely normal texture um, and so it's actually, there's a lot of differentiation going on that really helps identify what is being targeted in this area, what are enemies, what are friendlies. So it, you almost can't miss that your character is getting highlighted by this thing, which is a really nice visual choice. Yep. Yeah, they did a really nice job on that. Um, now, the, the, uh, the obvious uh, target here is our friend, the Warbot. Um, but it, it is pretty cool that you can potentially get... It almost looks like I can get... I think I've got everybody. I think I've got yeah. all of them. I'm just, just clipping the one on the top there. Yep. Here we go. Nice. Oh, that's a great visual effect, too, isn't it? Oh, that, 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 oh, that grid? Come here. I love the grid. Isn't that great? Listen, if you want to live through this, we got to take out the bastards with the rocket launcher up on the dam. We'll each find our own way up there and catch them front and back. Got it? <laughs> <laughs> I love the totally <laughs> inconsequential responses here. Mm. Well, it's, so that is a, there is a difference there. I mean, I, I don't think it has any major reactivity, but like you're, you know, this is like the understood major. This is the the good ranger. <laughs> and there's like yeah, the yeah, we got over it. here. <laughs> let's, let's, let's screw up, yeah. So, you know, you can kind of, you can kind of, uh, tone your character however you want, however yes. you imagine them. 
Yes. Well, well let, let's be. We'll, we'll talk to the major appropriately then. Good. Mm -hmm. And remember, Arizona's depending on us. There's no giving up here, there's no going back. All right, move out. And we, uh, we had to keep emphasizing that point um, because you never really see the Rangers back home. Oh, well, let me look at that. Do the bugs run. Come on, cousins. Don't let them scatter. Keep them together while I reload the rocket gun. Ooh, man, I love this thing. So that's important because that there's your boss. Like that guy, you just got introduced to him. Uh, you've been seeing his missiles coming in, so you, you already have a sense that there's that there's a threat up there on the dam, and, and Prasad talked about that too. Um, but that is the character that you're going to be heading toward throughout the rest of the sequence, and then confronting at the end of this. And you'll hear him; he he chimes in now and then throughout this. Um, that whole idea of like introducing your boss before you're actually having the fight with him that was that was an important reason why we did that throughout this level. Um, the other thing that you'll notice us doing throughout this game is um, always hearkening back in different ways, whether it's companions or uh, or just dialogue, to the situation in Arizona, right? Like, why are you doing this? You're doing it because the, the rangers back in Arizona need help. Um, if we screw up here, they are going to die. Right. Um, so always reminding people of the stakes is something that we had to do because you don't really, if you didn't play Wasteland 2, you don't really have a connection to that. So I want to show off what is, in my opinion, the single greatest achievement that this game has has achieved from a system design standpoint. So if you look at the battlefield, there's are numerous pickup and loot options around for all mm. the people who died. As yep. soon as you click on one of them, what happens uh, is, yeah. is it picks up all of them. Anything yep. that's a product of that battle, you can go through everything and you can just loot it all. You can take it all from this particular menu and you just go through and you pick all of them up and then they're gone. You don't have to run around and pick up each individual bag. You don't have to search through everything. It just goes through the whole battlefield, grabs all of the loot and done. And yep. that it's, it's glorious. is amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Yep. I don't know if we're the first game to do that. I, I think there's been other games that have done that, but it is it is wonderful. It yeah, is really, uh, really, really loving that. Uh, let me check the chat here. So uh, do any of the, I'm assuming the battle options have uh, hotkeys associated with them, or is there options to hot, uh, set up hotkeys? I think there might be hotkeys for doing these, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. Uh, if, you, if you go to escape and then look at the yeah. option... It would be there. Options, and then I'm assuming controls. There's there's yeah. full customization. Uh, yeah, attack left control. Uh, yeah, it looks like all of the stuff can be configured to your to your desires. So that's great. Um, another question: In turn-based games that let you have multiple actions per turn, where several characters each have an action, how do you design for the explosion of complexity due to order of actions? Um, if I understand that question correctly, um, I mean, part of that actually is what we did with um, one side versus the other uh, to give the player a little bit more control over. Um, oh, interesting. Oh, God. Well, yeah, hold, hold off for a second before you go over there. Yeah, I uh, know. We're talking about, talking about blood and guts. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So to, to control some of the complexity there, you know, we, we did do the thing where the, the player um, uh, the player can can sort of pick who they want to go first, and so they they have control over that. Um, I might have missed the first part of that question. Did that did that answer, as far as you can tell, Caleb? Uh, let's see. You have multiple actions for turn, or several characters each have an action. So I think I think the question was was just about that, like okay, now now the player is having to account for who goes when and in what order, and you can like do one partially and then you can do another partially, and just like the the sort of you know how how, how do you um, maybe another way of asking it would be how would how do you help carry the player through that decision making process? Yeah, how, how mm. designer builds around that complexity. 
Oh, I guess maybe from a design perspective, that's going to be more like how do you design your levels or your your field makeup of your enemies to account for the fact that the player can approach it in such a, a wide variety of ways, I guess. That might be it. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I think a lot of it, you know, is putting putting the control as much as possible into the hands of the player so they can decide and they can have the strategic and they can decide, like, what, what approach they want to use in, in any given combat. Uh, in some combats, uh, and I don't think we were able to do this in all of them, but in some combats, we do specifically design the field so that the player can approach it in different ways and we think about different potential um, character loadouts. Um, so that you know you've got your your sniper team or whatever you know you sort of make sure they have a way through it and you know you've got your melee characters and they have a way through it um and you'll see that probably more in the boss fights like in these little minor fights it's, it's less so um, and yeah <laughs> and I'm, I'm gonna try and move us along a little bit here in the game because there's there's actually quite a bit left to get through the tutorial but um, it's true oh, this this uh <laughs> This is uh, this is for blood and guts. Um, yeah. Yes. Yep. So uh, this this animation was created specifically. I remember this thing being oh created, and then I guess they found a, a place for it right here. Oh, so this this what's what's interesting from a design perspective here is that unlike in XCOM, and I keep coming back to the comparison just from a combat perspective, but that's a wild? you get a level and you're kind of you it's do the level and once you've completed the objectives you leave. But this game is actually really cool because the whole world is designed and laid out, and then if you end up in a situation where you become in combat, Are that just gets wild? laid over top of the world the as blood. it exists around you, um, which I think is really neat. I think it makes me feel more really involved in the world and you can see here that this wheel is if I if I enter this wheel this is going to trigger one of those combat slash interaction things or maybe an interaction that could lead to combat also Caleb you can actually snipe him from here and he'll just go down and that'll be it I'm gonna do that oh didn't work I miss <laughs> oh well <laughs> okay how about this Oh, I was using the wrong character. Oh, well. That will work too. I love that grid that lays down and rolls up. That is such a just like talking about like visual juice. I love it so much. Yep, it's really oh. it's great. Oh, uh, another thing, uh, if you hit left shift, uh, you'll see. Yep. So there's some things that you can interact with. There's no there's no loot there, but there's like little narratives, like a sentence of narrative description. Yeah. Right here is beaten to get he's beaten to death. Um, and you can do that all throughout the game. Like we actually have a lot of those that, that give a little more context. Oh, we missed that. Oh well. A guy <laughs> came out of <laughs> a, a ranger came out of there and he's like, Get off the ice and they go, <laughs> he just gets annihilated. <laughs> um Yeah, I I will say I I, I kind of I find myself using this mode all the time, but then I just am holding in shift all the time. I kind of wish mm. it toggled. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see that. There's some more blood and guts. Yep, more blood and guts. The, the, the door seat. Oh, that's cool. I love that flare. The, the Dorseys, oh, actually, before you go in there, the Dorseys, by the way, actually have a, um, they seem like they're just kind of like crazy wasteland guys, but they actually have a, uh, a, a fairly um, well thought out backstory that ties very closely to the main, uh, to like patriarch and all the stuff that's going on in Colorado. Mm. Um, they are more than perhaps they seem. Where's your CEO? How should I know? Maybe ah. you blew her up already. Jody Bell. Lies. Yes. This is this is this is good. This is really good to get to because it's it's an important point of narrative uh, consequences. Yep. Fuck! Your friends are here. Okay, Hotlanders, drop your guns and she doesn't die. Got it? Okay, so this is where your your skills actually become uh, an important thing. So you can just have like specific interactions you can have re reactions that are closed off to you so you, if you don't have a hard ass requirement of one you can't have this conversation this is kiss yep. ass of one you can um 
or you can just straight out attack her. So I, I'm going to suggest uh, you can you can ask that question if you want. Um, but if you want to save Jody Bell, which I would recommend, um, I would try to kiss ass. Sounds good. All right, fine. I'm going. I'm telling my cousins you're here. Ah, consequences. Thanks. Indeed. Saved my life. You probably should have killed that gal, though. Gonna warn her friends. <laughs> no worries. Just... Watch yourself. They're right outside. All right. So there's yeah, there's another one of those requirement not met things. Yeah, I didn't have first oh. aid when I played this through last time either. Uh, any other survivors from your squad? Do, do that one. Not likely. Most of them burned with our transport. A couple more went under the ice and... Wait, Major Tom, he might have made it. Saw him take off like a bat out of hell after we wrecked. Don't know if he'll come with you if you find him. He gets pretty spooked, but take these. Might get his attention. <laughs> Major's just his nickname you can just call him tom when you find him i hope we get to major tom we'll, we'll i see. hope we do i'm not sure if we'll okay so uh, uh at the risk of, of taking more time um there's a story behind jody Be bell um, that is fairly typical of development so um originally uh, well, Jody Bell didn't exist when we first made all this stuff. Um, and there was an earlier version of this game where um, vehicles were going to have drivers. So you were not like in combat and in any, every, any other situation. We had different vehicles the player could potentially get. And each one of them was going to have an NPC who was a driver who was always with that vehicle. Um, and so... We had to create characters who would be drivers for each. It was sort of like semi-companions who would be um, the driver for each of your vehicles. Uh, and I actually created Jody Bell. Oh. Much for saying goodbyes. This is her. So, a record. Her 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 yeah, yeah. This, this was to make the player feel really bad if she died. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, and also uh, to make the player, this again, we could draw the connection back to what's happening in Arizona. So that was yeah. Our So, uh, but Jody Bell, yeah, so Jody Bell. So, um, she she was the driver that I created for the player's uh, first vehicle, um, and then uh, later in development, drivers got cut. Mm. Um, but we already had a bunch of stuff for Jody, um, and we were like, like, can we use this stuff? Can we do something with it? So we turned her into a companion instead. Um, and there was a character here who was not Jody. It was a different character. It was just like some guy. And we were trying to figure out like how to make that, how to make it consequential to have him survive or not. Like he was going to be a guy, like a, a per, one of the personnel at the base, and he'd give you like some kind of little bonus or something. And we, we were never really crazy about any of that. So what we ended up doing was making Jody a optional companion. Uh, where you can get her and she can be a companion for the game and she's got content, you know, throughout the game or she can just die here and that's the <laughs> end of Jody Bell. Um, so it, it was interesting how she was a character who was originally purposed for one thing and then we took all of her content, repurposed it for something else and got some interesting choice and consequence out of it. So there was a, uh, a comment that Major Tom sounds like a great name and also is that a David Bowie reference? <laughs> it, it is indeed. Um, but there's there's obviously more to Major Tom. Wake up, hope, cousins! Hope more Hotlanders coming. So that was the woman that you just, just, just ran away. Guess we better finish off the rest of them. 
And of course, that also means that those guys just got executed. Yeah, so I was going to ask about that, actually, because this is the same thing that I did last time as I saved Jody. If you don't do that and you kill the woman beforehand, can you sneak up on them and save those guys? I believe you can. Uh, I think you save one of them. Okay. Um, I don't know if that person ends up... I think she doesn't end up coming with you. Like, I think she ends up being, like, so traumatized by the experience here that she doesn't go any further. But there is an interaction there, so there are some consequences. Yeah, that's what I was kind of curious about. Um, it's interesting. I mean, like, I, I really felt that because I, I, I came up here and then I was like, did I, you know, is could I have saved them if I hadn't saved Jody? Or that? So I, I, like, started asking those questions, which always get me yeah. paralyzed to, like, searching through Wikipedia pages, like, <laughs> who can I save? Can I save them all? You know? <laughs> yep. Yep. And, yeah, you, you definitely can save one of their lives. Like I said, I don't know that she becomes a, a member of your team or anything, but I... Like you can save her, and then she's alive somewhere in the game. Spotted them fuckers! The bullets are skull nukes. And this this combat can also be easier um, if you come in and they're not they're not alerted to you. Right, uh, right. You can take them out pretty. In fact, I think you can take out one of those like tanks, and it takes it kills most of them. Right. Yeah, a little note about cover here. And flanking. Yeah. And yeah, healing. A, and healing. You were talking yes. earlier about how, oh, they don't throw a lot of stuff at you. Unfortunately, they do here. Yes. Yep. But, ugh. Oh. Ooh, he does not hit for a lot. No, you notice it's it, they're not so easy now. Yeah. Persuade a friendly animal to join you. Hmm. I love Charm Animal. You're not going to get a lot out of it in this in this part of the game, but uh, you can later like you can have like this flock of like cats and chickens and all this stuff following you <laughs> throughout the game. Pretty fantastic. Me the deluge. Bless you all. So that was actually that was a smart move. Yeah, D Divinity Original Sin 2 has trained me well in the arts of fire in the landscape. So Lee Sing is not looking good. No, no, she she's not. I think I can fix that though. Okay. Oh jeez, one HP. That's the worst, oh, isn't it? That stinks. All right, where is my, where's my goods? Ah, the healing. Yep. Unfortunately, that just ate all of my. Yeah, it sure did. Do you have a better place to hide, or is that? Oh, there's William still got some. Well, I guess he can't do much. Yeah, I mean, I can't get over there because it's going to take three AP. So, yeah. oh, here we go. Ah, uh, helpful. <laughs> all them limbs. Not a bad place. Not a bad here we place. Go. All right. But uh, what, what I think what's happening where, where she gets she, she keeps getting hit is that uh, I think she's flanked maybe because that person yeah. is firing from behind her. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Oh, good shot. But not good enough. Dang. All right. Um. Let's see here. I actually. Can she hit that other guy? The one that's by her father? Uh, 55. Is not that yeah. Great. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, one of these two, but I'll, I'll probably take out this one. Ah. That's where a sniper's good to have. Good, and... Oh, wow, that was... That was awfully nice. 
<laughs> oh no! Oh no! I've never had this happen to me before. One of your rangers been downed. Okay, so we we have options for revival. That's good. So. I think you're okay. Hopefully, you won't party wipe in the first fight. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? Yep. All right. Uh, not enough AP, so I'm gonna sneak over here and defend. I'll slice off some bacon flank. Okay. Go here. Apparently, huh. I now have a gouged eye. Oof. That's fun. Not great for a sniper. <laughs> Ooh, that's true. That's very, very true. Okay, I'm just gonna do some, some play some defense. Ooh, she actually hit you. There we go. Oh, no. So that was not an easy fight. That was a little rough. That was actually quite a bit rougher than last time I did that fight. Now it looks like I can get up behind those yahoos on the top and take them unawares. Let me know when you're in position and we'll... <gasps> Shit! Incoming fire! Taking cover! Poor Major Prasad. <laughs> Things just don't go well for her. No. No, they don't. There was a... very disturbing point later <laughs> yeah so actually and th this is a good example of how this battlefield was set up for different approaches uh, um so you, you can see how you know you could there's there's obviously that we had to put cover everywhere so you could have come around one side you could have come around the other mm -hmm. you could be sniping from up on top and then the enemies can approach it from different ways too so sure. there was a fair amount of thought put into this battlefield Some more blood and guts coming. Oh yeah, lots more blood and guts coming. <laughs> if you didn't have your fill yet. Injury kit. I don't know if you ran into this, Caleb, but what, one thing that, that I wasn't... Is it the, actually, I guess... I don't know, it's not really happening now. I often would end up uh, not having my whole party coming, so I'd have to like keep remembering to uh, to select the whole party. Like I'd start running off, and I'd realize I just had one person running away. Yeah, yeah. Oh dear. Uh. Oh, another gut puppet to my name. You hearing this, Erastus? Uh -huh, you ought to be here. The deluge of blood has begun, and I'm winning, big brother. It's written now, in blood on the wall is welcome to Colorado. That little excerpt there did two things, right? It's again you're seeing the, the person who's going to be the boss and who's murdering your friends, the Rangers. Um, but he also mentioned Erastus, his big brother, who is going to be important later on, like past this whole sequence. Um, so we're sort of, even in these short little uh, little excerpts, we're sort of trying to get in as much narrative set up as we can. Yeah. There, there's, there's a tutorial window that's coming that's, I really enjoy this. <laughs> <laughs> um, enemy oh, detection. Yeah. There's a big robot ahead. Doesn't see you. Stay out of detection range. Um, however, we cannot stress enough how badly this robot <laughs> will mess you up right now. Yeah. It was, I, I remember reading that last time, and it was like, okay, like really trying to communicate what what the, the consequences are of this. Yeah. Yeah, so you have this, uh, there's a light machine gun turret up here, and then there's the war robot, which is even more powerful than the last one that you saw. Yeah. Um, so the, you have, and this is this is kind of like, I love this stuff in, in RPGs. I mean, like a big Deus Ex fan, like the, the multiple ways to solve a problem stuff. And so mm -hmm. you, you've got a broken valve, a computer, and a pile of corpses. Um, one of those may just be for narrative purposes, I'm not sure. Um, but basically, you, you have this option of, of solving the robot problem in multiple ways. Now, last time I came through, it was with nerds, and we used the computer to solve the problem. I'm curious 
uh, how problem solving will go this time around. Mm. And this whole thing is new. They added this after I left, so I'm not even sure. Okay, well, that requires a mechanic, which I don't think either of my characters are mechanics. Nerd stuff. Yeah. System admin required. What about the pipes? Do they do anything? Yeah, so there that requires an engineer. Uh. So <laughs> let's look that's at the corpse. <laughs> yep, that's just a narrative corpse. Uh, I'm assuming that this is just a we need to sneak around them kind of thing. Yeah, well, that's so that's his detection range. Yeah, which is pretty yeah, short. Yeah, you can. Yep. So actually, this is a neat little introduction to splitting the party. Yeah. That's kind of too bad I can't take it down because uh, there's a lot of nice loot on that thing. Yeah. Sneak, 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 sneak. All right. All right. Yeah, I'm just gonna do a little quick save here. And uh, you ain't ready for the deluge. <laughs> oh, hey, do we have lock picking? Yeah, I think you do. Cool. So maybe this is a little compensation. Oh, what is this? Oh, armor, okay. Yeah, now I'm not sure. I know that there's a thing here. Um, so y your player, so they, there are, like in your traditional RPG, uh, there's like traps and things. Um, mm. But you have to have a certain level of detection in order to, to see them. There is actually a mine right here in front of the weapon cache that I remember from, from the last time. So mm. you can actually sneak around over here to get it. <laughs> a little a little cheaty. Yeah. Having known knowing having about known. It, cool. But uh yeah, it, it'll it'll cause uh, some some pretty severe damage if you uh, just waltz up to the chest and it goes boom in your face. And one of the things about this game, I remember the first time I played Wasteland 2, um, was a little strange. There's no resting in this game. So you don't really you can't sleep to regain health. Um, mm. All you can do is use the uh, those little those little health ampule thing. I'm gonna put a couple of pieces of gear onto my characters here because I am. Uh... Yeah, I think that's it. That's all I got for now. Put my heavy armor gear on my melee character. Now we're coming up here on the, the boss Rangers, battle here. Versace, mm. took care of the hostiles who jumped me, but, but those bastards are still up there on the dam. I found a spot to hunker down and give you some cover when you get there. But I'm afraid this this will be mostly on you. Good luck and hurry. Oh, got some more loot for you there. Yep. Sorry, I was reading the chat, taking the ah. moment. Wars, Wars life. life. <laughs> <laughs> so this is another thing where we uh, we actually spent some writer time and came up with like a whole bunch of like wasteland specific brands. That's so funny. <laughs> There's you'll you'll find more of them as you play. That's really great. The rabbit's paw. Critical chance. I like critical chance. Why don't we put that on? Let's see. Where does it go? What is it? Uh, it? Might be the thing that you already have equipped. Oh, yeah. I see. I see. Penetration. Well, I'll keep that because. Yeah, that's fine. Don't need to worry about that yet. I think we're safe. Yeah, okay. They're just there lots lots of loot that they're going to give us here. Let's 
So, uh, nitro spike. Yeah, lots of stuff. That's good. Not that there's a boss encounter right up. Yeah, yeah. Right yeah the I, it's, it's it's always fo so funny, like seeing so, some of the level design because it. it, it yeah, you know, there's there's the there's the trope of it being a little bit obvious that you're you know oh there's a save clearly is a big boss coming up but Lydia and I oh, so my wife and I we watch movies sometimes or, or television shows and the character walks into like a big like area like oh boss fight you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. like the uh, the Mandalorian when he like fights the rhino or the rhino thing and he's like walking up oh, to yeah. the area where the rhino is and we're just like ah oh, boss fight incoming and so it's yep. it's just funny how that how that plays out sometimes but. Let's do a quick save. And I think I'm actually going to use this injury kit that I have. Which is nice, because actually I didn't receive any injuries last time, and so not that, um, I actually didn't know about the injury uh, mechanic. Hmm. Which is cool. That's we, helpful. We, we won't get to this, but there's actually a little quest in the first city that teaches you explicitly or is meant to teach you explicitly about injury kits and um, um, stopping bleeding and all that kind of stuff. All right. We walk up to the big door. Rough voices, laughter, and rocket fire. Tying into that the guy who's been talking to you. Door, <laughs> if, in case you were wondering if there's a boss fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to go back, you know, I'm just, bye later. Are you sure you want to open the door? <laughs> I feel like it's like when I was a DM again. <laughs> sure you want to go in there, guys? <laughs> yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, damn it. Looks like we killed them all. Guess the fun's over. Bummer. Wait a minute. Maybe not. Howdy, Hotlander. <laughs> Oh, as much fun as it is killing folk long distance. I like it best when the deluge of blood happens up close and personal. You know what I mean? <laughs> the rest is gonna be sorry he stayed home. He loves him some entrails. <laughs> There's the Erastus mention again. I believe he has entrails um, around his neck. Yeah, he's pretty gross. Um, <laughs> I think this is the first of these... Uh, close-up dialogues, right? Where you're actually seeing the character in a, a cinematic Yeah, movie. yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah, this, there was a there was a point oh, noted, right. and I want to emphasize this too. The voice acting in this game is incredible. Like, it's really, really mm -hmm. top quality. I love mm -hmm. the voice acting in this game. <laughs> and yep, it's in everything. Yep. Like, the, the recordings, the things on the side, the things you pick up, the radio, like every person you interact with it is just really really quality there's a guy later on called the prisoner oh yeah <laughs> some good voice oh, acting yeah. and and let me just tell you from a production perspective how difficult it is to get full voice acting in a mm -hmm. game like as much as players are like this is so cool like the the writing and design team is like oh god <laughs> we, we always like we or we know it's it's going to be tough when we have to do that yeah because uh, it means yeah. basically you have to get all the writing done early mm -hmm. um and then the other issue is like if you find bugs later on like once the voice uh the voice acting has been recorded and you need to change dialogue to Ooh. like deal with the bugs that's a big problem yeah um, so yeah it's a challenge but it's very impressive when it's pulled mm -hmm. off well mm -hmm. and this is this is well done I, i'm super yeah. good and I, I i agree with raul in the chat that uh melee combat 2 really sounds uh appropriate i think yep yeah that's cool we we did some sharp how you use it my... Ooh, i'll sharpen my knife on your bones and i'll wash it clean in your blood for the deluge is coming, you heathen, and I'm its harbinger. And it all begins here, you little prayer dog. What I do to you, the Darcy's gonna do to all of Colorado. So squeal all you want. No one's coming to save <laughs> Who saw that coming? <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! They done killed Jared. Thought he'd 
<sighs> Never shut up. Heads up, Rangers. More incoming. <laughs> so here's, here's a question for you, Caleb. Yeah. Um, as, a, as a player, um, is it satisfying to you to see that guy get like annihilated, or did you want to do that yourself? That's a really good question. Um, I'm trying to think back through my first playthrough. I feel like I it was it really like I was not expecting it because you know I mean I'm used I'm a player I'm I'm used to taking on the boss and just all that normal mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, it I was not expecting it at all, and to have have the major show up and be like kind of badass and everything is like really i i think it was a positive experience to see that happen be like oh yeah we've got people on our team we're not in here by ourselves that kind of a thing um this we, we, did, track, we debated that on our team like that was um we that was actually to have like the first the first um cinematic dialogue end with that was like something that we had wanted to do from i i, for, I don't even remember who requested it but that was like a long time in the game hmm. um but we were going back and forth on well is that you know the player's going to be irritated because they don't actually get to do it but i think you're absolutely right i think ultimately it probably was the right decision because it was so memorable and hmm. no one was expecting it so it's like that kind of thing that people will talk about to their friends um, and I think it's, you know, you, you've killed a thousand bosses that you hated and wanted to get rid of, but right. that hasn't happened very often. Right. I, I don't know if you could hear this music track that's happening underneath here, but it is something oh. literally special. Yeah. I need to see if so, I can bring this up a little bit. This is very much, this is Brian Fargo. Like he, um, he really wanted like voiced music, um, uh, cause that's just not done much in combat. Um, and this song in particular, he actually found, and then we ended up using it in this first combo. It's it's something real special. It's cool. And they were they were mentioning like the lyrics for this a few times, like leading up to this, there were like people saying stuff, people saying lines that were essentially drawn from the lyrics of the song. Right, right. what I did last time. Oh, there you go. I believe that is what my opening move was last time. Yep. And we got two. Yeah, this is this is an interesting thing. I, I've seen something similar in, in other games where you basically are every time you is a, a, make a successful attack, you get sort of like a a meter here that you're filling up for a special attack that you can do only only sometimes when you've completely filled this up. I think actually BattleTech was doing something similar to that, where you could kind of like build up to a, a special attack. I haven't used much of these yet, but. But it is actually well timed that this would show up sometime around this last battle. Yep. Yeah, there was there was definitely an attempt to sort of base out these concepts so that you introduce a couple core concepts in the first fight, a couple core concepts in the second fight, and then like some stuff like this in the third fight. I, I think it I, it, fe- it feels really well spaced out, like the. Uh, tutorials are notoriously difficult to get right. Um, oh yeah, and so I, I, I feel like this is this does a really good job of, of that like, 
separating out all the pieces and they all come together. Early boy. As I would like it to be. Mm. Got another attack. Uh, it's not a very good shot. Yeah, and she's not close to any of those exploding barrels either, is she? Oh, that works. <laughs> that works really well. I'll take it. Just gonna play it safe here. Jeez. I just ate a missile. <laughs> you did. Didn't, really, didn't do that much, did it? No, I was surprised. I was like, oh boy, that's not gonna go over well. <laughs> wow eats a missile and still kills somebody <laughs> in the same turn <laughs> oh and there's a level up system all right quick save grab our loot somewhere in here Muscle tissue. <laughs> yes. Give me that muscle tissue. I do like it when, when things are labeled as junk. Yeah. And you just know that there's no... there's. Don't be a hoarder. You don't need the stuff. Just sell it at the first opportunity. Like. So who, who exactly is paying $15 for random muscle tissue? <laughs> like, like, I have to wonder that. <laughs> uh, it is the wasteland, I guess. I'm gonna read. I'm gonna take a second here and read the chat real quick. L liking the music. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the emphasis of the the heads, the guy's head blowing up. That anything can happen. This is a game where anything can happen. Yep. yep. And that that's that was intended. Uh, talking about looping music. Yeah. M music in games is always interesting because there has to be dynamic in nature to a degree. Mm. Uh, oh, here's an actual question. What's your opinion of adding reinforcements at turn X? And when should they be any reinforcements versus friendly reinforcements? Because that happened later as the enemies got reinforcements. Yeah, I, I think when done in moderation, uh, it can really enrich a fight. Like, if it's semi-unexpected, I think it can be good. Um, it can increase the tension of the fight. You know, if you're like, oh, I'm doing pretty well, and then all of a sudden more guys come in, that can be pretty cool. Um, poor Major Prasad. Um, I don't know if you've ever played Dun uh, Dragon Age 2. I played uh, the first one. So... <laughs> So Dragon Age 2 is an example of reinforcements done really bad. Oh, no. Um, so in every fight, like I mean every fight, um, you would run in, you'd be fighting some people, and then all of a sudden, like, I'm not even kidding, reinforcements would actually drop from the sky into the fight. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you'd be dude, fighting, like, some guys, some, I don't know, like, rogues or thieves on the street, and all of a sudden, like, just out of nowhere, like, it would just rain, like, a few more enemies, and oftentimes that would happen like two or three times in a fight. It was just, it and you was just awful. never knew if it was going to happen. You just never knew, yeah, or how, where they were coming from, or like you're in the middle of a field and like some some uh, some demons just like rain into the fight. Like I don't know why so that <laughs> that was bad, but but I think this is done. Uh, it's done more strategically, and I think mm -hmm. in those cases it can be really cool. And it made sense. I mean, those two guys were in the shed off to the side, which you can then go yep. into as a player. Like, you can yep. go walk around in the shed, and they, they just came out of the shed, you know. Um, 
All right, so let's talk to, to Major Prasad here. Her guts are spilling through her bloody fingers. Nice work yeah. finishing off that jerk's crew. Did you find any other survivors? Bell's a good kid. Thank you. You did well. Now. Crap. I'm bleeding all over the paperwork. We need to, to head for Colorado Springs. Establish a headquarters at Peterson Air Force Base. Support the Patriarch, no matter what. We do that, and the Patriarch sends aid to the Arizona Rangers. We don't, and the Rangers are fucked. And that brings me to the secret orders. Uh, only me. Uh, got them from... Got them from General Woodson. When we first heard from the Patriarch, General Woodson sent an, sent an advanced team to Colorado, led by Angela... Death. But they went dark. We have to find them. So Angela Death is a, was an important character in Wasteland 2. Um, mm. Obviously, that's why we have questions in here like, who's where Angela Death? Like, if you never right. played Wasteland 2. But those who played Wasteland 2, actually it says right there, we thought Angie Death was killed on a mission to California. Like, her her fate was left obscure at the end of Wasteland 2. Uh, um, gotcha. But, like, I really liked her. A lot of people really liked the character. So we brought her back for this one. Um, but, obviously, players who played that last game might think that she was dead. Sure. I'll, I'll I'll leave this for the lore for other people to dive into later. Absolutely. Give me a second. Catch my breath, and we can go. Oof. So I, I have to say, I actually wrote maybe the original version of this dialogue, and I, I felt so bad writing it. Because <laughs> I like this character, and I'm like, oh, man, this is not like, going to end well for I'm going to get up, we're going to keep going, and we're going to go do it. Uh... Quite some options here. Uh, yeah, there are. There's no real way for this to end great, but there are ways for it to end less bad. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter how bad my wounds are. We can't stay here. So, uh, with uh, some of these other options being out, and neither of those being particularly great we're just gonna go ahead and help her up <laughs> yep. maybe it'll work out uh... <gasps> yeah. and the end of major prasad yep. and now we loot her body <laughs> <It's an RPG. laughs> we got good armor. <laughs> <laughs> look at look at all this loot we just got. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. It does it does run against the emotions of the scene. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perhaps. Alrighty, we got one more important character to interact oh. with. Hey, look. As you get close, you see the cat has a dog tag rather than a collar, which is embossed with the name Tom. I also want to point out uh, the hat that the cat is wearing, which is fantastic. Is great. Uh, so now, in this eat. case, uh, I wasn't sure if you would, what you would end up doing with Jody, but sure. uh, Animal Whisperer, you don't even have to worry about it. But, <laughs> but if you do have cigarettes for the cigarette-smoking cat, um, you can get him that way, too. <laughs> Such a... <laughs> uh, oh hey Raul has a narrative reason to loot her don't let the equipment fall into uh, enemy hands yes excellent well, well, well since we picked animal whisper we'll go ahead and use that ground control the major tomcat oh I love that somebody voiced that meow yep <laughs> Now Major Tomcat is with us. And, and follows us around, first, which is cool. Your first pet. Yeah, so <laughs> I see there's a there's a collection of things here. 
I'm assuming that the... Oh, because this is the same bar where the, the negative effect was as well. Mm. So yeah, I think, uh, I think they carried it over from um, Wasteland 2. Having different pets in your party gives, gives your whole party bonuses as well. Um, gotcha. So Major Tomcat actually is useful in fighting, but um, just his presence gives you uh, gives you some some useful gameplay effects as as cats do as they do hey Jared little brother how goes that daily use your blood you dry gulch them hotlanders yet Erastus J -J -J Jared's dead they killed him gunned him down like a dog what no no! If I ever catch who did this, they're dead! Every last one of them dead! You hear me? My brother will be avenged! And Foreshadowing! <laughs> For another boss. He's, uh, and he's. It, we did what I think is some kind of interesting stuff with this, like. Uh, it's not really a linear progression. Like the next thing you're going to be going to is, is the city, and he's not actually there. But he is a sort of a side quest that gets set up later on. Mm. Um, that is repercussions for what you do, which we have a lot of. Things. And here's your vehicle. Yeah. So there was uh, comments in the chat about uh, voice acting localization, and if the uh, the cat needed to be uh, re-recorded <laughs> at any point. <laughs> well. <laughs> Who knows? Because uh, I believe meow is like represented differently in different languages. Right, right. Um, we we did not, as far as I know, I don't think we localized po. Uh, it is uncommon to localize po, not unheard of. Uh, but for smaller studios and for like sort of what I would call double A, um, it's less common. Oh, well, that's awesome! They have a little a little idle animation of him cleaning himself. That is super cool. Uh, <laughs> but I, I don't think the vo got localized in this. All right, let's go ahead and interact with our cool-looking thing with a turret on top. Actually, it's pretty Was cool that design. Major Brassad? Oh, I got Major her. Cody. God damn it! Fuck this place. Fuck it. I see how you're setting her up to be the driver. Yeah. That was the original, yeah. yeah. But, but I, elements not. of that I still see there, yeah. Yep. And now we're going to meet the patriarch. Welcome, Rangers. You may approach the patriarch. Three. When there were fifty. Cold logic says I should turn you away. That there aren't enough of you left to do the job at hand. But that Dorsey ambush was my fault. And I owe you more than explanations and apologies. So, here's something more tangible. The Dorseys didn't just attack you. They attacked my city. This one was trying to burn down our jail. If you want some vengeance for what was done to you, he's yours. Uh, yeah, so there's a there there's some choices here and obviously there's quite a bit more game that was left to play. Um, but yep. I'm kind of I'm going to kind of push a lot of the rest of this to the side because uh, we're we're getting close to being about out of time. Um, that was a a good run through. I'm glad that we got this far because there was a lot of good stuff to go yep. through in that first level. But um uh, I do want to say that we wanted to give people some extra time here towards the end. Uh, 
specifically like maybe a little bit less about Wasteland 3, though feel free to ask any questions or anything that you'd be curious about with Wasteland 3. Um, but uh, George is a, a longtime game developer in the professional industry, and he's got a lot of experience he is pulling from. Um, if there are any questions that people have for George just about his experiences in the industry or um, anything like that, I, I'm sure George would love to, to engage with you all on that. So we'll take a couple extra minutes to, to field questions and that kind of a thing. But uh, George, do you think we should uh, should kill him or let the patriarch do it? <laughs> so, you know, I have never seen, almost everybody says, he's your prisoner, you can do the honors. I've never seen the kill the Dorsey, so let's let's do it. That's kind of funny because I actually did that last time. Oh, wow, cool. <laughs> Be my guest. <laughs> oh, okay. I wish I could give oh, yeah. you all the Dorseys. The marshals like that. Before all this is over. I will. But for now, let me address your immediate needs. In addition to this base and the aid I promised your general, I'll be giving you the resources to return your force to full strength. Recruiting, training, and equipping. It's not enough. I know. The men and women you lost can never be replaced, but it's what I can give you. I hope you'll accept it. The, the Patriarch is, by design, a very complex character. Mm, um, I, I can tell that. He's... So we, I, I actually wanted to have a character who is... On his face, he's a dictator. But there's reasons for why he's done everything he's... You know, the, the world he's living in and some of the situations that have come up for him. And, you know, as this game goes on, you will be able to decide, you know, do I agree with what this guy's done? Like, do I understand it? Or do I not? Um, mm. And he, there are no easy decisions with this guy. Sure. Well, just a little preview of what happens after this is you actually get access to this base that you then have to sort of start converting into a place that you can use. And I'm sure it gets more and more complex and you start recruiting people and building a team and going on quests and that kind of a thing. There's a huge, expansive world in here that I have only personally just barely touched the little tiniest right. bit of, but I want to get into it more because there's a lot of really rich narrative depth here that I think is really going to be fun to explore. Um, I'm going to move us away from the game so we can field some more questions. Um, sure. So, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Raul says he notices that you are credited as both a writer and a designer. Did you start with one and move into the other, or are they both kind of blended? Um, they're Well, ultimately, they're both kind of blended, but I actually did start in the industry as a writer uh, way back in 2001. Um, I was a writer. I, I was hired as a writer on a um, an MMO called Earth and Beyond, uh, and that was like my intention was always to be a designer. Um, they didn't even have the term narrative designer back then, but that's essentially kind of where I wanted to go and, and a level designer slash narrative designer. Um, so writing was something that I was good at that got me in, um, but then I pushed very quickly to try to learn the design skills as well. Um, because I think you're um, more so to, today, there is more specialization. So there are people who can get by just being one thing, but I think the more things you can do uh, and the more aspects of game development that you understand, the more valuable you are um, and the more you can contribute to the game as a whole. Um, so I, I always encourage people, even though, Sometimes AAA doesn't really encourage this as much. I always encourage people to think of themselves more in sort of generalist terms and to go outside your area of specialty and learn, you know, what it is that the other parts of design or engineering or whatever your discipline is, like learn more about what, what those other uh, uh, members of your team do and try to branch out as much as you can. Mm. We have a question from Jason. What design or narrative strategies do you use to help the player emphasize with, uh, sorry, empathize with the characters that are role playing? The characters that they are playing or the characters that like they meet? Uh, well, this is, this, the, the, this is worded as they role play and maybe Jason can clarify that. Um, okay. Uh, well, like a, a lot of times, so I've worked in, I've probably worked in more games where you are not playing as a pre-designed character. You're playing as a character that you create. Mm. Uh, or at most, like this, where you sort of have... There's some very loose characterization, but um, 
it's not um, it, it's it's not really fully developed and it's sort of more in your head. Um, so giving players um, giving players archetypes that they can latch on to throughout the game. So like um, for example, thinking about um, you know, a game like this, uh, considering ahead of time, like what are the types of rangers that we that the player might want to play? Right, you mm -hmm. could you might want to play as like the badass, um, uh, you know, dirty Harry kind of ranger who like you just did, you know, shoots people in the head and it doesn't. There's no mercy, and you're just like um, you're a badass. Um, so we want to give players that that track that they can you know they can be that kind of a character. You might want to play like a much more by the book. Uh, you know, minimize killing people like a, that, that sort of archetype of ranger. So we try to think ahead of time, um, what are the different ways the player may want to represent themselves in the game and then try to give those choices uh, and represent those points of view as much as we can throughout the game. Um, it is different, I think, when you're writing for something like The Witcher, um, where you're, you're, actually, you're actually playing a pre-developed character. I haven't done as much of that. Um, so I probably can't speak to that quite as well. Mm. A question from Raul. As a writer and designer myself, what's a way to share these skills in a portfolio to share with the potential employers? It's one thing to post my art on ArtStation, but how to share writing and design? Yeah, that is tough. Um, so uh, if you're having a hard time with that, like it's not just you. Um, what I think we like to see um is game work to the greatest extent possible um so if you have made a game um either on your own or with other people if you can like if you've got a game that you can whether it's i don't know a little indie thing or something that you can share with your employer um, so they can actually play it and you're like i did this part of this game um that is really useful uh another thing is if you're just trying to show off your writing or narrative skills going to um going to one of the branching dialogue tools that are out there and there are a lot of them um and creating something in one of those tools and then using that um as a showcase so it's like yes i can make branching dialogue and interesting characters and here it is. here's an example of what i can do um that's another way to do it um writing samples on paper are less paper I mean, I actually mean anything that's just like prose on a page. Um, probably less useful nowadays. Uh, we used to accept stuff like that, but now we really want to see that you are doing interactive narrative work. Um, so something you can actually show that you have created and finished is the best thing that you can do. And if you have more of that, um, well, the more the better. Mm question from Jason. Uh, when first designing a new game, do you start with mechanics first or narrative first or a blend of both? So that depends a lot. Like I, it depends a lot on the game. I personally, I probably start more with the narrative first or like the high level vision of um, who the player is and what they're doing and the place they're in. Um, I I think it's important to have a high level vision of the, the types of mechanics that you're going to like, is this, is this an RPG, like a party based RPG, or is this a platformer? Um, but I don't personally go into the details of the mechanics until later. I usually start with the narrative and the themes and the setting and the characters. And then the specific mechanics come out of that as opposed to the other way around. The other way around is a perfectly valid way to do it too. Um, it's just I I operate better kind of coming from the narrative and going to the mechanics. Um, but you know that it, it depends on the individual. like it can it can work either way. And a question from Wes, as a designer, how much of the game do you actually get to see as it's being developed? It sounds like you might not always see the final product. Is this by design or just happenstance? Uh, well, in this particular case, I didn't see it because I left the company <laughs> like, about <laughs> nine months before the game shipped. So um, that's why I'm seeing some of this throughout this. And I'm like, oh, look, they added that. Um, typically, I would see everything and I would be playtesting, especially as a lead. I would be playtesting this thing to death, like all the way through. Um, and I would, I would know this game so well 
I would not want to play it after it's released, <laughs> um, which is almost always the case. Like I am so sick of most games like upon release that I won't even, you know, I've, I've played every bit of them. I played it through from beginning to end. I, you know, I put in tons of bugs and tons of feedback. Um, and I'm just so done with that thing. I don't want to play it again. Once it's released. <laughs> um, but one thing that I do uh, that is really useful is I love watching let's plays of my games after mm. they're released because you see the way people react to stuff. Um, and it, it's, it's like seeing the game again for the first time through a new pair, a different pair of eyes. Oh. Um, and even though you are like, you are so sick of this game, you will see things uh, from the other per from the other player's perspective that you'll, and you'll realize, Oh, look at that. Like they saw that differently than I was assuming. And you learn a lot that way. I mean, there's been things where I've, I've assumed, oh yeah, you know, this totally works, this makes sense. And then somebody plays through, you know, whether it's a level or a narrative or whatever, and they, and they something is, doesn't make sense to them or something is, they perceive differently than you would have expected. And then you could take that experience into your next game and you're going to be a better designer for it. Mm. Um, or even you can take that experience into the expansion if you're working on the expansion right, and, right. Then, and then do a better job on the expansion because of that. Scott, uh, follow up to that is uh, how did you like participating in a let's play of your own game? <laughs> oh, I love it. It's fun. Um, <laughs> so seeing, seeing Caleb's reactions and also it's really fun to sit down and be like, um, if the audience is interested to like, look at like Jody Bell or other things where you're like, Oh, there's a story behind why that's the way it is. Mm. Um, and so many times, like if you, if you are um, playing through a game and you see something that's like, why would they have done that? There's almost always a story behind it. Like there's almost, if you asked one of the developers, they'd be like, Oh man, we didn't want it to be like that, but it ended up that way because this, 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 and this. Um, so it, it, I don't know. I, I love telling those stories and I love listening to those stories when, when I'm able to. Uh, Wes is curious if you happen to play any D and D campaigns. I'm assuming uh, this is tabletop. Tabletop. I haven't played tabletop in a long time now. Um, so it's gosh, when was the last time? Probably maybe when I was at obsidian. Um, so a lot of game companies will have tabletop, like the designers will have tabletop games or programmers and artists too. Um, going like at the company. Uh, I know Obsidian has at least one or two uh, games going. Um, I haven't played in a while because I, I, uh, I'm, I'm here in Columbus now and uh, I don't work at a studio in person. So, you know, there's not a lot of people around. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it, that was like how I got into this in the first place uh, was like being a DM and, you know, learning how players react to things that you do. Like it's such a good, um, it's such a good like starting uh, training for for a game designer. Mm. That was uh, one thing that we've done at, at Digimancy is we just recently started playing uh, like like every other Friday. I think we're going to start doing it right playing games yep. we just played so. Among Us for the first time yep. as a company. Uh, so not D and D by a long shot, but uh, uh, it was it was actually quite humorous because I think half of us didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> Oh yeah, I had never played before. I was completely clueless, but it was still a really fun. Um, and yeah, I was it was what like maybe seven or eight of us. But yeah, it's a it's a really good way, especially for like if you're in a if you're on a remote team, mm -hmm. it's a really good way to like have some uh, some quality like just hang out time with your team. It's really valuable. Yeah, absolutely. I almost kind of wanted to open up the can of worms of like, how has it been working with and forming a remote team? Um, I know that's been a big part of, of Digimancy's existence. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> the timing on Digimancy turned out to be tragically perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> because, uh, so I had planned to create a, a remote team in like 2019 when I, we first, like me and the other founders conceived this. Um, and then like right around the time that we were starting to put together our, um, our team for this publisher back project, um, COVID happened. So it turned out like really well. Um, but, and we were sort of prepared for what everyone else ultimately had to do. Um, a lot of the studios I work for are operating now as remote teams. 
Um, so we're all sort of trying, having to figure this out together at the same time. Um, I think it's gone really well overall. Um, as long as you have people who know what they're getting into and don't mind working remotely, like there, there are certain people who can, who have no problem doing that. Like there is, I think some people will get kind of lonely working in their little room all day, even though you're talking to people a lot. Um, so I think some people are better suited for it than others. Uh, I know people who are great game developers, but would never want to just sit in their room all day and, and you know, without having a, a team around them. Mm. Um, so if you if you can gather a team who know what they're getting into and are self motivated and can do the work by themselves mm. in the off or by you know in in separate places, um, then it works. Um, mm. But you just you have to really know what you're getting into and and know that you're the kind of person who can motivate yourself even though you're in a room by yourself most of the time. So I've got one last question. Uh, this is one's from uh, Wes. Uh, this is a, a question on how do you know when to stop writing world building concepts for a game? Like you could potentially, this is kind of like almost a general sort of art question of like you can continue trying to fix little details or continue to try, but when do you finally have to say, okay, it's done. Like I, I can't touch it anymore. <laughs> That's a really hard question. Um, <laughs> so, uh, there's there's a few different answers. I mean, the the easiest answer is it's time to start making the game because the publisher says so. So <laughs> no more messing around with the setting stuff. Um, another part of it is I always try to leave like you need a certain amount of setting and narrative stuff set up before you start going um, just just in order to do basic work. But I try to leave some things open. Um, so that you have some leeway as you go in because um, as you're creating a story or as you're building levels and creating the game there are times when you're like i need to figure out some more lore here or we need to bring in something else or oh wouldn't it be good if there was like another country over there you know, like next door to the the nation that we're in that had these characteristics so you want to kind of have a certain amount of um, freedom to be able to create that stuff on the fly as you move forward and enrich your world. Um, so you kind of want to leave some things open. I think I, I tend to leave more things open than some designers are comfortable with. So like, I'll be like, we don't even need a map of this world. Who cares? And then like some of the other designers are like, no, George, we really need a map of this world to, just to understand what the heck we're doing. So like, okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, I think leaving, leaving some amount of stuff open is good. Um, and giving yourself, you know, like some, some freedom to be able to, to move forward in the future. Um, some of it is also just like experience and instinct and knowing how much, like a lot of designers, when they first start, they do too much. Like they feel like I have to have every inch of this world and every single character figured out. Mm. Uh, and I was like that, like 30 years ago too. Um, but you sort of, after a while, start to figure out like how much of this we have to figure out now and how much we can kind of be like, eh, let it ride, you know, we'll be okay. Um, so at least half of it's experience. That's interesting too, because th thinking about it in comparison to other uh, like visual media of like film, you know, the only thing that really matters is what is in front of the frame, like what's in front of the yeah. lens. Like it doesn't matter anything else that's behind it. It's only the stuff that you put in front of the player. So unless the design is to put everything in front of the player, you don't have to build a whole room. You just need to build the corner of the room that you're showing them. And, and I will say um, something that is very tempting to do when you have a lot of backstory and, other information written it is very tempting to create dialogues where you give the player the option to say tell me the history of the dwarves and then you all of a sudden are writing like 90 pages of, of <laughs> expedition inside your dialogues and no one's interested so <laughs> it there there's also a certain amount of self-preservation there like if you don't write tons and tons of stuff you are not going to be tempted to put giant exposition dumps in dialogues. Um, there is a good thing though of, of making the world feel a little bigger. So if you can like have characters in fiction referencing things like mm. saying, oh, uh, I made the Kessel run in 12 parsecs right, or whatever. Right. Like, 
And then they never talk about it again. And then so fans are like, what's that? And they're like <laughs> making fan fiction about it. But like in the game, you don't say anything else about it. It's just assumed that people have some understanding of what that is. Like that's a really effective way of world building because you're leaving all these little mm. threads here and there that you can, in a future product, you can go and do something with or right, your fans right. can do something with. Um, so that act, that's good world building. If you have the discipline to come up with that stuff, but not like vomit all that information in, in, in dialogues to your players, that's a really smart way to do it. But a lot of people don't have that discipline. So, well, and when you start good. talking about a series, like a collection of games that are all kind of building on that, like, uh, Angela death, um, yeah. you know, that's, uh, a, 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 a a continuation of building upon those threads that were left in before. So actually like leaving things unresolved can actually be really great for continuing to build out a richness of a world, which is really, it's really great. Absolutely. All uh, right. Well, um, thank you everyone for your participation. Thank you, George, uh, for sure. coming along and, and on their, uh, wasteland three adventure. Uh, I had a lot of fun. I think it was really good. Um, yeah, and I had fun too. And I, I, I feel like I really want to dive in, and and especially because I, knowing you as as a narrative writer, and and knowing how how much of a hand you had in this, like, there's there's got to be some really excellent narrative threads and decisions that are on the the path before in, in this game. So I'm I'm really I'm really excited to getting to jump in and and do a little bit more and, and learn a little bit more about this world that you have. Cool. Yeah, there's there's some uh, there's some tough choices in this game, and yeah. uh, and some interesting interesting consequences as you'll see. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you to everyone out at Cog. Um, we we're always so great to, uh, grateful to see everybody online, and um, we'll be uh, gearing up for. I think the next thing we have is our regular game dev meetup group. I don't remember what the date is going to be on that, but. Um. Yeah. Oh well, we'll 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 announce that later. <laughs> anyway, I'm back <laughs> with announcements. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, and um, we will see you all next time. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Indeed. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. All right. Cheers.